let's let's get started resume from where we left off so um, what i want to kind of recall a little bit if you settle make it easier because apparently the acoustics makes it difficult if everyone talks at the same time so um, if you recall i was talking about the difference between say a naive based model uh, a logistic regression model and a, a markov network model in particular uh, when when you relationalize all of them so this is the relational naive based relational uh, logistic regression and markov logic networks the point i was trying to make was when you think of these logic models think about inductive logic programming think about any first order logic they are in some sense invariant of the population size as the number of object increases the behavior will not change okay that's how you want your your appropriate model to be but with markov logic networks for instance they kind of change uh, they actually change drastically as the population size changes as you can see on the uh, uh, y axis is the conditional uh, distribution it's the posterior that you're computing um, and on the x axis is the population as the population size increases um, the thing is it goes anywhere between 0.62 and i guess 0.45 and that's a pretty big variance in terms of your uh, posterior. So uh, this uh, prompted us to introduce this notion of uh, logistic regression or relational logistic regression. This is a simple example that we have been working on. It's a real uh, problem. Um, we are looking at postpartum depression in women. And one of the indicators of postpartum depression is the relationship problems. So basically, let's say X is uh, a woman that you're looking at and you're looking at postpartum depression. And then you're looking at basically, the, let's say that the number of relations with whom they have problems, right? It could not just be um, that woman's uh, partner. It could be mom, dad, friends, so on and so forth. Any relation, if they have a lot of problems, that can cause postpartum depression. And so what we want to build are models that are independent of the number of relationship problems that they have. They kind of scale at least smoothly with the number of relations. They don't have to be independent, but they have to scale smoothly with the number of relations. And so, again, I want to get into the human and the loop part, so I'm not going to introduce 100 different models. But what I want to say was the way we are achieving it is explicitly computing the number of true groundings and false groundings. And turns out that you can actually boost this as well by using some form of, uh, you know, um, you can look at a regularized least square regression and kind of uh, take the gradient with respect to the, the functions on, of this, and we can get some nice gradients as well, and it works. Okay. So but the point I want to simply talk about is the fact that that's one advantage of a model like relational logistic regression is that it's much smoother in how it's transitioning um, with population sizes. Okay, whatever I spoke are uh, time, right? So, uh, I mean, whatever I've spoke was non-dynamic. So the next question obviously is how can you handle time? And as I said, extending to dynamic models in some cases is pretty easy. Bayesian networks, dynamic Bayesian networks, hidden Markov model. People know this a lot. We have handled this very well. Most of the algorithms kind of scale to the temporal dimension. It's pretty easy. And actually, 10 years back, I used to say time is just another relation. Put time as a parameter, observe it, you're done. But turns out that it's actually not that easy because of the key assumption. The key assumption is that if you assume time as just another parameter, you're discretizing time. You're talking in terms of days. You're talking in terms of minutes and hours. We'll go back to the medical example. Let's say you have you have 300 observations for myself, and let's say you have 30 observations for Fabrizio. Now the question is, how do you put both of us in the same feature vector? You can do one of two things. You can collapse my number of observations so that they match his, or you can impute his observation to match mine. And both of them are not correct, right? So as an example, simple things. Let's say I'm interested in predicting heart attack. And let's say this is a male, because there are two heart attacks and this person is still alive. Right, so this is a male, and I'm looking at this, and I get multiple data points. I can maybe measure blood pressure at different points. My, I can measure the BMI. Maybe I can also monitor based on some sensory input. These are. This does not mean this person is ex exercising. It just means that I get an observation about an exercise. Okay, lack of exercise is an observation. So I'm getting a bunch of observations, but look at the different number of observations that I get, and the times at which I'm getting. They are not the standard uh, time scale. Okay. So um, to do this, um, you build models called as continuous uh, time uh, Bayesian network, continuous time Markov processes, where you observe that you can get uh, observations at different time steps. 
you can have different types of networks at different time steps and you can start constructing these models. So um, the key thing is that when I'm doing this, I'm not assuming that T1, the difference between T1 and T0 is the same as the difference between T2 and T1. They could be multiple time steps, they could be observations. So this is basically modeling time uh, uh, faithfully. I'm just going to give you an intuition on how this works. I'm not going into the details. It's right after a coffee break. I know you have some fuel, but I don't want to drain it in the first two slides. But uh, the idea is very simple <laughs> and a little bit depressing. Okay. Uh, let's say I'm tra uh, uh, trying to predict death of a person. Okay. What is the one thing we know about death? You can come back. That's true. But let's say I'm interested in predicting death. It will happen. Right? Face it. That's the reality. All of us are going to die. Just dust. Nobody gives a damn after some time. So we're all going to die. Sure. Death is it's certainty. It's going to be there. The other thing is very simple, right? The longer you wait, the longer you wait, the higher is the probability of dying. Correct? Somebody in their 30s has a much lower probability in the normal state than somebody in the 90s who's also normal. Okay, the longer you wait, higher is the probability of death. Turns out a beautiful distribution can capture it. Any guesses? Which distribution can possibly capture this? An exponential distribution. As time increases, the chances increase over time. Okay, so what these are essentially, they are basically some forms of exponential distributions. Um, we were talking about this that are memory, memoryless, but you can add memory to them by using these things called con uh, conditional intensity matrices, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to skip all this uh, in the interest of time. And again, because I don't want to take care of uh, this thing out, but what we have done is we have taken a continuous time division network and relationalized it. This is a 2016 AAAI paper where we can actually apply this on things like electronic health records and they work beautifully. And to do that, again, uh, like the other logical um, I'm pretty sure Fabrizio talked about these things. So you can look at all these um, logic based models. You can define this and now what you can do is on top of them. You can start adding the so-called conditional intensity matrices and what we have shown is these can be boosted as well. Okay. <coughs> the thing that I want to simply show is um, the way it works is by switching. Okay. So you basically expect let's say that blood pressure is high medium or low and you can say that the blood pressure switches from low to medium and maybe medium to low and low to high. So it basically does some kind of transitions and the whole point is predicting when the transitions happen and predicting when the transition happen is really computing the expectation of a continuous uh, of an exponential distribution. Okay. And what we've shown is you can actually find the factors that influence that expectation using boosting. The coolest thing I think about this work is the fact that you can show for the, the first time a boosting gradient boosting conversion. Okay because of the fact that the function is concave, you can actually show that using the Hessians, you can show that we have a theoretical proof that the boosting algorithm finds the global optimum and not the local optimum for one of these distributions. And in experimental results, we actually showed that we can get a good results. By the way, this is when I was supposed to have a break, but uh, you kind of made me do it early, which is okay, <laughs> not a problem. So keep the questions asking. Uh, coming so that I can uh, give you more breaks. So we can also do hidden data. Okay, one of you asked that nice question when I was walking. Um, does boosting assume that you need to you need all the data? Turns out that you can actually do uh, the same thing like the uh, standard way. You have your input data, you have observed data, um, you have the hidden data. Um, you can generate a bunch of trees, learn a model like how you would do. Using these model, you can sample the hidden states, which is computing the expectation. You can, uh, uh, using that expectation, you can generate these regression examples, um, learn new models, add them to the current model, and keep going on. So really, you can do the same thing. Um, the thing about relational models, this is the good thing about relational models, okay, is most of the facts in the real world are false, okay? If I'm in a, predict, um, in a binary setting, most things are false. Let's simply take an example. Most people are not married to each other. Okay, married relation is pretty small. In some cases, like some precedents, there may be three or four, 
but mostly it's around one or two. Okay, so that's that's the uh, standard uh, numbers. And most people, let let me ask you this: Who has in your Facebook uh, over thousand friends? Right, come on. I have six hundred. Come on. Nobody a thousand, eight hundred, seven hundred, six hundred. Put your hand up. It's fine. Put up. Uh, your name? The one in the white shirt. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think you're popular? I think you are. With six hundred friends, you seem pretty popular, right? Yeah. Do you think that's a large number? Six hundred. Why not? You know people with fifteen hundred. Oh, 5,000. That looks big. Do you know the population of India? A billion. Actually, 1.1 billion. You know how many friends are possible? 1.1 billion square. What is 5,000 in front of it? Minuscule. Right? But the point I'm trying to make is this. This is kind of giving an arbitrary, uh, it might seem an arbitrary discussion, but there's an important point here. Most data in relational models are false. Most of the things are not true, okay? So what happened in our thing that we saw was if I assume, let's say I know that 5,000 friends are true, but I only observe 4,500 4, friends, it does not matter. I can assume that everything else is false and I run my boosting because of the fact that it fixes mistakes. It actually fixed all the mistakes. So even though we had a theoretically sound method, boosting that simply said whatever I don't observe is false, in relational data gave me good results. We tried this in the recommendation system. We tried on electronic health records. We got similar results, which is kind of an important thing to see that as long as you get some good data, you can still learn a robust model if you make assumptions about what you don't see as false. Make sense? Okay, so we got a journal paper, yes, but, but I mean, would I use EM for relational data? Not so much, at least the way we were. If you do boosting, because of the fact that boosting is so good at fixing mistakes, you can get other things that can take care of this. Um, as a side, we have also been doing this on learning um, uh, policies, learning to act in real world. So we have relational reinforcement learning problems. Um, this is under review and uh, we can learn relational policies. Um, so the point I want to make, and I want to get into the meat of humans quickly, we can do relational dependency networks, Markov Nergic networks, CTBNs, hidden data, as I said, we can learn to act. Our first implementation that worked really well was a real-time strategy game called Vargas, um, which is an open source version of Strategus, which is the first Age of Empires out there, okay? And we can learn how to defend towers. We can learn when to attack enemies, what should be the strategy of attacking enemies at a higher level. And the beautiful thing was, it was independent of the number of objects. And actually we applied this even on transfer learning or domain adaptation. We can change the number of objects. We can change the rules of games a little bit and it worked beautifully, okay? Um, the thing, as I said, is that we have also learned this on many uh, um, types of distributions. Multinomials are the standard ones that we have started. Um, Christian and his group, and we have extended this to do Poisson models. As I said, exponentials. Actually, you can show convergence on exponentials. Um, we now have results on Gaussians and even uh, Dirichlet distributions. So we can hand boost to different types of models and they work uh, uh, really well actually in, in many, many, many domains. And so the shout out that I wanna give is that we can handle and do well on standard data sets, okay? Blah, 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 but boring, really boring. Who cares about these data sets? The data sets that I really care about are actually the ones that uh, we have good results on. We, can, uh, we have good results on this cardiovascular study. I wanna talk about this for about three, four minutes before I move on. When I joined a medical school in 2010, my boss who hired me, he's the chair of the uh, radiology department, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Carr, he came and said, Sridham, I have this gold mine for you. Okay, and I thought, I'm a new faculty. Okay, he's my boss. We are in our honeymoon period. So he wants to be nice to me. Okay, one hour later, I said, wow, this is not a gold mine, this is a diamond mine. Okay, why? Because this data set, you can't see, sorry, because of all these images, this data set, was started to be collected in 1985, okay? In 1985, they brought 5,000 people um, and they started collecting information. They did some blood tests, they asked some social questions, they asked their economic status, their personal status, so on and so forth. They brought them back in 1987. 90, 92, 95, 2005, 10, 15, okay? 
now there are 3700 people 3700 people still in the data so they are 72% retention rate you know the other beautiful thing is when they were in 1985 most of these people were between the ages of 18 and 30 so now 30 years later they are between 48 and 60 and now some of them have starting to have heart attacks so it's gold because i can go back and predict which of them are going to have heart attack 30 years later i'll tell you the sober story we can predict it very well why because people don't change over time once a slob always a slob i never exercised when i was 18 i don't exercise in my 40 it's the same and that is so clear from the data very few people change their behavior and so um, the other thing is of course you can actually show that men are more prone to heart attack and so on and so forth um, that's a nice uh, study that we have got really good results with boosting uh, we have actually one of the first implementations of this boosting in the real world was on an electronic health record from Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin. And we can actually predict heart attacks much better than any other uh, methods because uh, we can uh, handle these relations pretty well. Same thing goes with Alzheimer's um, because we can use these MRI images over time essentially as graphs and graphs are relations and you can actually boost these very well. Um, what we are doing is three-way classification. Okay, So you can predict whether somebody has Alzheimer's somebody who is normal that is cognitively normal so if i'm putting all of us in a straight line uh, in one dimension it's a gross misrepresentation but let's say that you can do this on one end are people who are have alzheimer's on the other end are people who are completely normal but there is this entire area murky between them okay so if you read a binary classification alzheimer's or not if you read anything less than 92 percent throw that paper out useless because the data that they are looking is people who are have alzheimer's and who are completely normal and, and that's actually a very easy task to distinguish. But the people in between are really hard. They are called what is called MCI or mildly cognitively impaired. Um, the best explanation for this was given by my neuroradiologist collaborator, Dr. Muljan. Joseph Muljan came to me and he said, Sri Ram, understand MCI like this. I know you really want your NSF proposal funded. And let's say I take your MRI the day, night after your, uh, the night of the result. Let's say your uh, proposal gets rejected and I I take your MRI, you will fall under MCI. So severe trauma of any sort can put a person under MCI. So not everybody who has MCI go on to become Alzheimer's. Half of them recover to become uh, normal. So the real question is, can we identify these people? Turns out that running boosting on this, we, we actually got some excellent results. Uh, it was published in Journal of Neuroradiology, Neurotrauma and so on. We got some very, very good results on, on this as well. Actually one interesting story, and this was asked to me in two days back when I gave this, uh, focused on this in, in uh, Serbia, they asked me this question. Did you give anything useful for these people, for the neuroradiologists, or did you just mine the knowledge that they already knew? We actually found something. So we had, so the thing is people know that right here in the parahippocampus uh, region, if there is a lot of fluid that causes Alzheimer's, okay? But turned out that we, in our experiments, that came first, great. But then always the first tree, second node, or the second tree's first node was the frontal gyrus, the part here. That the radiology community was split, the neuroradiology community was split. Is it, uh, were they useful uh, to predict or not? And so when we got this first, he was so excited because he's like, we always thought that there is a correlation, but you picked it up. And we ran many, many, many tests and it, the same thing came up. So yeah, we were able to supplement whatever they knew with additional information. So that's where I guess, hope for machine learning is in general. And of course, relational learning in particular is very, very useful in these problems. So we've done this on uh, survey data. Um, we worked with IBM on doing handwriting recognition. Um, I'll talk about this a little later. As I said, we dabble with NLP. So we've done a lot of large scale information extraction. But the one success story that I want to really uh, say, if somebody says, what is the application for SRL, a real application of SRL, here is one. We actually built a recommendation system that runs in a multi-million dollar company. I can't tell you the name of the company, but the paper is there, so you could read it. Uh, so uh, it runs in a multi-million dollar company. Um, it can scale to millions of uh, jobs and millions of people now. It's the same boosting code that works beautifully. And I'll talk about this uh, when I come to advice uh, in particular. And we have started working on uh, scaling boosting um, using databases. Actually, what we showed was the language bias called as mode when used along with databases can, can actually improve upon our boosting. Okay, so. What we did was, um, this This is DB Boost, the green, this is the boosting with modes. This is our original boosting that we implemented on Java. This is the boosting on databases without modes. 
So this kind of clearly shows the use of ILP plus, I mean, some bias from ILP plus databases over just using uh, an ILP based system and a database based system. Okay, clearly ILP is more useful because of the fact that you can control and bias your knowledge very well, your search process very well. And bringing that into databases, we got better results. By the way, all of them, except the databases, both the blue and the green had the same uh, performance. This is large scale in terms of time okay, on the um, Y axis, but the databases were exponentially faster than databases with language bias was exponentially faster than just using databases. And we have again uh, worked on other uh, uh, ways of scaling this up by transforming things into a hypergraph and doing computations on hypergraph and blah, 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 blah. They are working great. You don't have to know this, but you, you have to understand that now we can scale these algorithms to very, very large amounts of data very effectively. The thing I request all of you, if you're interested at all in this uh, work, is try it yourself, okay? Um, there's been several people, thankfully, from mainly uh, Europe, a couple of people from Brazil who have been really using our system and coming back, they send us an email saying, hey, this component doesn't work or there's simply a bug here and we fix it immediately for you, okay? We will do it very quickly. Um, we have a team running this. The entire software is up there. Uh, we have a nice uh, tutorial that uh, we work on actually every Friday is what I call as hackathon where my students work on this code. So we are doing weekly developments, uh, fixing things, uh, bug fixing. You have your favorite data, you can get it to run, uh, reach out to us. Most of the time it is how you do the bias, okay? Most people who know how to run an ILP system can easily get this to run. Um, the, and, and, but setting modes is not always intuitive, but we'll help you set modes and, and do this. So the, as I said, the entire tutorial is up there uh, with full example how to uh, create uh, the files required, uh, how to create the positive negative examples, all the other uh, stuff, okay? And so feel free to try it. Um, and now I'm going to start getting the, into the human side of things. Any questions? No, okay. So the thing uh, I, I want to push here is that the human can do actually a lot more or, or a lot less, however you want to see this, than what they are doing now, okay? So if you think about strategic relation learning, um, probabilistic ILP and so on, they use first order logic as underlying representation, which were in some sense the classic AI systems that the humans were able to uh, write the domain experts are able to do this. However, the SRL research is primarily data driven or in some sense fully expert driven. So on one side, again, I like this gross simplification, even though they don't really represent everything, they kind of get the idea clearly, right? On one side is where um, the human is uh, reduced to a mere labeler, okay? The human is there only to give you labels and nothing more. Okay, your uh, my uh, gradient boosting, the structure learning methods that I talked about, the classic machine learning, deep network, deeper network, deepest network, so on. They all treat human as a mere labeler. On the other side is where the human is a full oracle, but somewhere in between are these parameter learning, weight learning methods, where it's EM. There is a lot of human effort involved because the human has still give the qualitative structure, the rules, and uh, the algorithms only estimate the quantities, the weights or probabilities using EM or gradient descent. Um, of course, at the other end, where the human is an all-knowing oracle in some gives you the uh, uh, structure and the parameters, and all we are doing is just uh, pure reasoning. But in the middle, there are a whole bunch of algorithms, okay? On one side, closer to the examples are active learning feature selection, okay? What does active learning do? Well, I, I basically have a model based on this model on the unlabeled data, like somebody was asking about semi-supervised learning. On the unlabeled data, I'm going to uh, pick an example and present it to the user, get the label, and keep going. Yeah, sure, you're reducing the human effort, but you're still treating human as a labeler, okay? But in the center, I think, is what uh, these advice-giving systems are. But they are not new. They are they have been around since at least 1994. Um, actually, the first paper came out in 1991, but the best paper in my head at least came out in 1994. So again, on one side are expert systems. This is the amount of knowledge you need from the expert, and this is the amount of training data you need uh, uh, to learn a model. Again, higher means more on both sides. So you need a lot of uh, expert knowledge, limited amount of training data. The standard machine learning, you, uh, you have a lot of training data, probably little human intervention. Somewhere in the middle are these systems that can uh, combine knowledge and data. Again, I'm not going to claim at, that this is any uh, new because they have been around for a long time. 
the K band work for which uh, Jude Shavlik has been pretty famous um, was was in the early 90s, where he was basically figuring out how to give knowledge to the artificial neural network. Which is why when I see this explainable deep models, sometimes you can't wonder have people read this paper because the set of papers in those three years and this is 20 years back talked about how to extract knowledge out of neural networks and you could do most of this even now. Um, anyway, uh, then it was extended by Fung and uh, Alvi Mangasari and, and Jude Shavlik, the support vector machines, uh, Elasticate, and then um, Gautam and others did some work on um, inverse reinforcement learning. So what I'm going to talk about are these knowledge-based systems. So what is this knowledge? Okay, turns out that there are many forms of knowledge that one could give. The first one are what we call as qualitative constraints. You could ask a human, tell me what you know about the data. And the human could say, well, as one quantity increases, the other quantity increases. Examples, as the, the uh, probability of, uh, let's say, as the cholesterol level increases, the probability of heart attack increases. As the cholesterol level, as the blood sugar level increases, the probability of heart attack increases. As you get closer and closer to a holiday, the flight, the flight price increases. Okay, these are what are called as monotonicities. They don't exactly tell you the probability. They don't exactly tell you what the probability is. But if I'm going to view this as a distribution, on one side you have the closer you are to holiday, on the other side you have the price. And basically it just says how this probability mass changes inside the distribution. So it gives you constraints on the probability distribution and no more. Okay, so that is a classic example of a monotonicity. But I can have other things like synergies and stuff. Again, these are not new. Um, Benjamin Kuipers defined this in 1980s. Okay, this is 1980s work on qualitative reasoning, qualitative constraints. We are now adapting these to machine learning problems. So the other one is what is called a synergy. You can now talk about two or three things together. You can say a higher cholesterol level has a high risk of heart attacks with high BMI than low BMI. So if the person is fit, then a little bit of high cholesterol level is okay. Okay, that's that's a that's another simple statement that doesn't work for me, but that's a simple statement, right? That you can take and you can say, okay, now I can figure out how two factors together influence the third. Does it make sense? Or, or even if you are closer to the closer to the holidays, will have a higher impact in busy routes than in non-busy routes. So if the flight is generally half empty, then it doesn't matter whether it's closer to the um, holiday or not the prices always are low okay so you can get these uh, statements and humans are great at this knowledge actually we get a lot of good knowledge one of the reasons that the um, that the um, we this thing works both in the recommendation system and in that logistics uh, problems that we work on is because of the fact that we can get this knowledge very 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 easy from domain experts the other type of knowledge is precision recall trade-off and this is one that I really want to spend at least one minute to talk about and because we don't think about this all the time. As I said, most examples in the real world are false. Most people are not married to each other. Most people um, are not friends with each other. Most people don't get a disease, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you get the idea. But some things are not, cannot be handled the same all the time. Let me give you an example, Ebola. Okay, uh, given that it's now a very important epidemic that we have to consider. Think about the false positives versus false negatives. What is a false positive? Somebody who doesn't have Ebola, I'm going to, my classifier says has Ebola. That's a false positive. What's a false negative? The other way, somebody who has Ebola, my classifier says does not have Ebola. Now think about the cost. I'm from the United States now. Everything is cost driven. You have to talk in terms of money everywhere. Otherwise nobody gives a damn to what you're talking about. Okay, so let's talk in terms of money. What is the worst thing that's gonna happen with the false positive? Somebody who does not have Ebola, and I'm, there are four or five of them, I say that they have Ebola. Well, I'm going to quarantine them for a few days and then realize they are not a threat. We'll release them. What are they going to do? They're going to sue me and my model. It will cost me a million dollars each. Sure, a few million dollars. What happens about a false negative? Somebody tell me, what, what will happen in a false negative? They, they, they run, run, well, they don't have to run around, they walk around, <laughs> but I get your point. They are out in the open, it becomes an epidemic. And that's gonna cost billions of dollars because to control an epidemic. So this is a case where we say recall is more important than the precision. Exact opposite is recommendation system. 
Today morning, I got an email from LinkedIn. And the LinkedIn email every day is funny. There are 15 job recommendations for you. And every day I tell myself, I need to unsubscribe from LinkedIn. I don't do that. I don't know why. 15 job recommendations. You go through the first one is postdoctoral research associate. And I'm like, I did that 10 years back. I've been there, done that. I've done my time. I'm out. You're making me go back and do a postdoc. The best one was Indiana, when, when I was in IU, Indiana University lab assistant, right? For my collaborator. And these are not important to me. Why? The point is that they are not maximizing their position. Okay, if they maximize their position, it doesn't matter whether I get all the relevant jobs. The re jobs that you are showing me need to be relevant. So that is, the, that is the case of maximizing position. The healthcare is a case of maximizing recall. And what you need are things that people tell me, if this problem, position is more important than recall. And that is actually the single most important thing for many of these learning problems. And you can get that from people, okay? The third one is what Craig Boutillier calls as preference elicitation, where I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I don't really know much about these qualitative relationships, but I know about preferences. So for instance, this person can say, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this data, 50% of the people are not stopping in stop signs. Okay, but I prefer that you stop in stop signs if it's safe to do so. Okay, you stop at stop signs. I prefer that if this is a multicultural, uh, this thing, people tend to be more Democrats than Republicans in, in the US. And these are things that you know, there is a preference knowledge that you can elicit and work off of it. Um, the last one that we have been working on is uh, uh, um, what we call, what is called as privileged information by Vapnik, where you know some knowledge during training that you don't have during testing. Okay, it's like a teacher teaching in class. They give you a lot of hints, alternative ways of solving problem. But when it comes to the exam, you don't have those hints or the ways. You have to solve it differently. So as an example, this is true in our uh, data set. Let's say we are working with these neuroradiologists and I'm detecting Alzheimer's. I may have electronic health record data. I have imaging data. But because I'm doing this in a clinical study during training, I have more things. I have their cognitive assessment tests, okay? And I have their, uh, maybe I put them in smart homes. I can have their wearable sensor data, their smart home data, their behavioral data. I have a lot of data during training. But when I'm diagnosing a patient, I'm just doing this diagnosis inside a hospital. So I have only my electronic health record and imaging data. I don't have any of these data. So what do I do? I have to use these, not in my model. If I use these in my model, they'll be completely unobserved here. Then I have to do probabilistic inference over that. That's crazy. I don't need to do that. Instead, what you want to do is use these as constraints to somehow distinguish between two models here. And I'm learning only with this. So you use these as constraints to learn a better model with only the electronic health record and images so that when I get that, I know how to operate on it. Okay, make sense? No. Okay, so you don't, the point is this is a clinical study. Okay, in this clinical study, I can get extra information because I have a lot of time with you. I can sit with you, talk to you. I can get more information. But when I'm actually being diagnosed, there is no time. They have only the image and this, and they have to make a decision. So when I'm learning a model, if I'm using this information, they become latent or unobserved. And I can't use that. So what you want to do is use these if I have one model A and model B, in the simplest case, I have model A and model B. This is going to tell me which of these two models are better. Okay, so in some sense, you can, you can use this as constraints when learning the models here. Okay, that's what uh, Vapnik did with support vector machines. We have done this for boosting and other algorithms. Okay, so you use them just to guide your model to a better solution rather than using these directly in your model. That's why they are called privileged information because they are privileged. You don't see them in the test data. You see them only in the training data. Okay. Hopefully it's a little bit clearer now. So what are these advice? Basically they are just for us simple English statements. You want to say things like slow down for red light. In a driving domain, if you're approaching a light that is uh, red, then you kind of slow down. That's your advice. Um, the domain that we were uh, applying this mainly was an image classification uh, domain where 
uh, so my student was going to work in Los Alamos National Lab and people who know Los Alamos, they work with these um, NASA images a lot. So this guy was so excited because he's like, I'm going to work on astronomical data, the macroscopic images. When they went, when he went actually and joined the lab, and I get a kick out of this every time, they gave him microscopic fruit fly images. So he didn't get the astronomy, he went for flies. But the most important thing about these images is that if you're classifying membranes, people miss out a lot because these are tiny areas that are hard to pick. But people can give you knowledge. Yeah, I know I missed it, but it's there. And they can tell you that it's there, surrounded by many membranes. You can actually uh, find that. It's always in this dense region. It's just too boring to look at it. Think of your father when he is teaching you how to drive. He will run through stoplights. He will run through red light. He will turn around and say, you cannot do it. I can do it. You cannot. OK? The example may be wrong, but the intention is correct. The advice is correct. OK? So those are the types of advice. And we were doing this even in transfer learning. So we were learning on straight roads and applied on a curved roads. Of course, it's a simulator. Um, we don't have as much money as Uber does. So we were uh, doing this on straight roads, uh, learning, and then transferring to curved roads. The first advice give, we gave was, when you're approaching a curve, slow down. And that helped a lot. So these are simple advice that you can give to your model on top of your fair learning algorithms. OK? So the obvious question is, how can you do this for boosting? How can you use this inside boosting? Um, one way to do this inside boosting is you can take this as my initial knowledge. Just create clauses as your initial knowledge run boosting. The problem there is that over time, data will overrule advice because boosting overfits to the data, the data will overrule advice. So instead, what you really need to do is find out a way in which you can take the advice and combine with data much more effectively. So in some sense, you can think of it as a linear combination. So this is the advice effect. This is my data effect. I combine these two and I'm computing gradients. Okay, so um, I'll show you how to do this. But understand that what you want to do is at every step of computation of gradients, you take into account how much of the advice do you satisfy and the data and compute the difference. That becomes a gradient and uh, keep adding this. There's a lot of, uh, 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 lot of uh, work that we have done on this, okay? So why is it mathematically justified? A very simple, so you remember this is basically, if you ignore this part, and I'm sure you don't remember, but if you think about it, this is exactly the objective function for boosting. Okay, I raised e power psi divided by, I had one plus e power psi because uh, in the binary case, psi is zero for zero, when y is zero. But in the general case, it's over all y e power this. Okay, this is used to be the expression. Now I add a cost. Okay, this is the only thing I add. What is this cost? This cost is simply this function. The number of times an example uh, satisfies advice minus the number of advice rules that the example violates. So if I give you 20 advice rule, you look at this example, does this example satisfy an advice? Count the number of times it satisfies the advice minus the number of times it violates an advice. So higher is uh, this number and you take the negative of this. Higher is this number, the, ne the negative, the cost will be higher. Okay, so you want in the ideal case this to be zero, and this to be the max, then that's good. The cost is lower, then it's good, right? So you don't want maximum violations. You want as much satisfaction of advice as possible. So if you have good data, this tends to be pretty good. If you have bad data, then then this, this, this cost is pretty high, right? So what happens is if I crunch through the math, and you should be thankful that I'm not crunching through the math, um, but it's not too difficult. You get this, in my head, at least nice expression. This is my I minus P. This is my data expression that I had. This is what is the probability that the label is true according to my data minus, sorry, what is the data true according to my data? Uh, is the example true according to my data minus the probability of the example being true according to my model? I minus P. Remember 0.83, sorry, 0.73 and 0.17. That, okay? Plus lambda times the violation of advice. So what it's doing is kind of a linear combination of data and advice. So one nice feature is if you have good data and bad advice, it can still do fine. You have bad data and good advice, it'll do fine. 
so we can handle the case when the expert is uh, not uh, uh, not perfect and the data is actually pretty good and the opposite case when the data is not perfect and the expert is pretty good actually turns out that most of the time we get a mixed thing the expert is uh, uh, because of the fact that he or she is an expert they are generally good on most problems very they make very small mistakes but the data is typically noisy okay so um, this 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 works uh, beautifully for us in many experiments i'll i'll show a couple of them um, actually we did this even for uh, linear programs um, for taking advice in inverse reinforcement learning for learning reward functions this is not using boosting but the idea is the same you you actually have two constraints this is a linear program you have two constraints one constraint on the uh, advice um, uh, and that is the this side and the other constraint is on the uh, data that is here so you have an explicit trade off between data and advice while learning reward functions uh, while learning policies so when you it, it really is not dependent on on the type of model you get this nice general formulation of a, a direct trade off between data uh, and advice and and that kind of um, in some sense distinguishes between good data bad expert bad data good expert you can still handle that very well so going back to the fruit fly this is actually a problem we solved in los alamos they were pretty powerful so um, this as i said these images have some specific noise they call it targeted noise because the noise always happens in some regions the advice is very good with just three rules remember just three rules we got 99.1% accuracy without any advice running the gradient boosting treating this as a propositional flat feature vector we got 68 just doing our gradient boosting we got 79 and then initial model so instead of taking the advice properly into the system we just said well i'm going to take this advice as an initial bias i was still able to get a good jump of 91.5% but we couldn't solve the problem when we did our boosting the right way it solved the problem we have 99.1% accuracy on a real image uh, classification task inside los alamos national lab it works beautifully um the same thing happened in some sense for um the precision recall trade off so if you are going to ask me a question in the break you could ask me how do you choose the difference between precision and recall like how do i know that precision is 10 times more important than recall all you need to do tell me is precision is more important than recall or recall is more important than precision what we have shown is so these are the different values for precision and recall and these are different numbers you don't have to worry about this no matter what this numbers are as long as they are in within a certain range a reasonable range you get similar performance across all domains but without using the importance between precision and recall the f measure is pretty low we are actually looking at the f my pressure so f5 uh, measure is pretty low uh, if you don't do boosting we are not getting much results um, but if you do boosting we are getting a small bump but if you know exactly whether precision is more important or recall is more important you can actually get much better results um, this is true i mean the journal paper has the uh, the results with uh, the uh, uh, information retrieval uh, task and of course uh, in in some domains uh, like uh, nlp in particular when we talk to the experts they can actually give us pretty cool uh, advice something like if a drug and an effect are uh, present in a in in an uh, adverse event that i'm looking for and a sentence that contains both then it's uh, then it's an ade or if they are present in the proposed ade and a sentence has both and the sentence contains the pattern drug induced effect then ade is true so you can actually start adding advice rules from expert which learn make my model learning so much more easier and we get some uh, pretty good results on this as well um there are more results on the papers um, you could you could check that out um, and they work uh, really well 3 minutes break i've seen 10 people yawn so we'll take the 3 minute break uh, i was waiting till i count that 10 right i got that so we'll take the 3 minute break and then i'll finish by actually bringing in the human into the loop okay and i'll explain what it means so 10 minutes break thanks twice so what think let's pause for a minute and think about what i have covered so far we started with okay i have some initial model and then i'm going to just learn the parameters parameter learning i have only data and then i'm going to learn both the rules and the parameters structure learning and then in the last uh, quarter we talked about how you can have data but you also get some knowledge so we ran some user experiments okay 
and and the results are a little bit interesting so i'll talk about the results but to motivate the results let's look at this diagram okay now i'm learning let's say a, this is a, a classic example of a support vector machine i'm learning a, a linear svm so that's a line that separates positive and negative examples so what are these logic rules what are these rules let's say these conjunctions of clauses turns out they are just constraints in in the space of examples okay so all the they are basically if i'm um, extrapolating them on your dimensions they become polygons okay so this constraint is basically saying anything under this black triangle inside this black triangle is a positive example anything inside this blue is a negative example then what you do you learn a line that represent that that uh, in some sense respects these constraints because imagine this without these two polygons a line here could be a good example line here could be an example right adding these constraints on top of just these uh, labeled examples it's like giving you a lot more examples so that's what advice gives you advice gives you in one fell swoop a lot of examples that you don't get otherwise or will take a lot of time to collect does it make sense yes come on wake up just 40 minutes i need to see a lot more heads nod okay so that's what happens here now comes the human problem i ask humans to give me advice they can give me all kinds of advice okay as you can clearly see some are way more important than the others this is practically a useful useless advice for me because my examples are here and my examples are here this is nearly useless there's no point in giving me this advice but maybe these two are extremely important advice pieces probably this more than than say this part of this rectangle so when we do our human advice what happened was that we saw that humans are very good at stating the obvious okay things that you can tease out from the data humans are good at saying that but they also have some knowledge about things that you don't see in the data but they can't see the data so they don't quite tell you that so it's kind of motivated from a slightly different perspective maybe the humans should not give us knowledge in the beginning maybe they should give us through the process make it truly human in the loop that's why i'm calling it as closing the loop so an ideal system should be like a student okay i have a processing but how i process is different from my neighbor and i'm going to ask you a question you tell me the answer to that question that helps me learn something better so the idea is if you let the model ask questions instead of the human tell you up front it's going to be a better teaching system right so that's what we are after so we are calling this as active uh, i uh, advice seeking active guidance solicitation the motivation is very simple on this side is the number of labeled examples on 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 x axis is the guidance so let's say n is the number of examples learned by uh, a classic machine learning algorithm you can actually show this by a uh, pack learning uh, based on the hypothesis size you can sorry you can come based on the hypothesis size you can calculate the expected number of examples there's been theoretical results that show that when you do active learning where the learner is querying for examples rather than getting all the other examples you can actually achieve an exponential speed up which is a logarithmic in in number of examples needed so this is log of uh, np in some sense if you have a bunch of examples n that you need for your full model learning active learning can actually work very well with log n as also work that shows if i just use an advice based learning instead of active learning if i use advice as constraints you can still get a logarithmic improvement okay and this is kind of empirically also verified and uh, definitely uh, you can show this theoretically um, using the optimization literature you can do these two so these two are straightforward proven this is our conjecture hypothesis that we are doing is what if i combine these two what if i combine the active learning with advice seeking so that's why we call it as active guidance elicitation the idea is very simple i don't want the human to keep talking all the time like how shriram is doing now instead i will read and when i have a question i'll ask you it's like how we talk to parents when we were teenagers Shh. let me ask you when i need a answer right so that's the way so can can a, can we assume that we have a human expert available and can we ask questions as needed and the hypothesis that we have is this 
can reduce uh, the learning in some sense in doubly exponential time. Does it make sense? So from passive learning to active learning, there is an uh, exponential uh, speed up. From passive learning to advice learning, there is an exponential speed up. Putting these two together might achieve a doubly exponential speed up. It's a conjecture. We have not proved it yet. Um, we are still working on it. Um, but we have started getting experimental results that show that uh, beautifully. And so we have some results that can, that can demonstrate this. OK? OK, so let's, I'm going to do a, a refresher on how you do active learning. Active learning you, is uh, typically one of the uh, most powerful semi-supervised learning methods, which means that there are some data that are gold standard labeled well. There are a whole bunch of examples that I have not labeled yet. So what do I do? I learn a model from the data, and I generate prediction over kind of the unlabeled data. So I'm looking at the unlabeled data, and I'm making some predictions, and I can use any of my favorite measures, and there's a whole bunch of measures that you can use to calculate explicit uncertainty on the data that are unlabeled. You choose the example that have the max uncertainty, the ones you are most doubtful about, give it to the human, get the label. So that's active learning. Okay, the typical research inside active learning is really the uncertainties. How do I compute uncertainty? What is the strategy um, that I could use? What are the measures that I could be using? And how do I select based on this? So these are the two steps in which there's been a lot of work inside active learning. Of course, there's been some work on the interaction between what algorithm I'm using for prediction with the uncertainty. So not all algorithms work with all uncertainty measures. Um, so these three steps are where most of the research inside active learning goes. So what we are doing is we are getting inspired by active learning. By the way, feel free to stop me um, at any time if you want to ask questions, okay? Um, and because this is kind of like the base for us, yes. The label, exactly. In the traditional active learning setting, the only uh, advice you get from the human is labels. But there have been um, extensions of active learning where humans can give you subset of features that are important. So you can get the feature elicitation methods. You can, uh, you can question about a feature value. So there's been some extensions on features. But the, the, old, the classic principle is getting the label. OK? But you can extend it to do features as well. That's a good question. Any other question? Yeah. So you're trying to understand active learning or advice giving? OK. So yeah, so um, that's a good question. So advice in, in ILP is typically on how to control the search of your learning process. Because remember, it's, you're basically exploring an in potentially infinite space. And you want to control that search. So sometimes what happens is the constraints that you put on the search may violate your data. The data might not reflect it. And there you have to find out, should I give importance to the constraints right, and ignore the data point? Or should I modify my constraint, maybe go out of the constraint, because I want to trust my data? That is the explicit choice you have to make. Should I, if, if a constraint is violated, should I keep, still keep the data or throw it out? Right? That, that is the choice you have to make in terms of advice. Yes, that's an excellent question. So coming back to active learning. So this is what active learning does. I learn a model, I generate predictions, I compute uncertainty, and then I select examples. We are making two changes, really, just small two changes to this algorithm. The first one is you don't read, learn any model. You learn a relational probabilistic model, gradient boosting. That's what we use. Do all this, and instead of selecting an example, you select a class that has the highest uncertainty. So you learn, let's say, a tree, but the leaf of the tree indicates that this is, I'm not confident about this. You present that class to the user and get some advice. OK? And, and, and then uh, that can happen. So if it's a little bit abstract, uh, let me give you a concrete example, <laughs> an example um, in which most humans fail, predicting the result of US elections in 2016, let's say. Okay, and now I'm interested in predicting which states vote Democrat. Okay, 
So in US, typically you have a bunch of states called swing states. These are the states that basically, depending on what you drank yesterday or what you ate in the morning, the vote changes. Okay? They're called swing states, and you have many states like that, about 20 of them, that can vote one way or the other. The others are much more st stable and steady. And I don't know if steady is good or bad. That's a different question. Okay? Now, what I could do is when I'm learning a model, I might learn some rules. And one rule that I learned is this. I could learn that a, a, a West region with a democratic governor. This is a state that's on the western side of the US with a democratic governor. Or my rule could say, well, I'm going to look at some states whose primary manufacturing is industry, um, uh, industry, right? Manufacturing, right? Whose primary industry is manufacturing. That could be things like Iowa, uh, Michigan, and Ohio, and, and so on, West Virginia, and so on. So there's a bunch of states here, Wisconsin. So what do I do? So you have a bunch of states here that my, my rule is picking up. You have a bunch of states here that my rule is picking up. You give it to the user. Now, this is a case where it's a binary classification, like Democrat or Republican. So the, it appears like a label, but it's not really a label. It is a soft constraint. The user is going to say something like, well, in these cases, it's most likely, like I prefer, that it is a Democrat. In this case, it's most likely that is, I prefer that it's a Republican. But you know, in 2008, this was uh, Wisconsin, and it voted uh, Obama. Ohio voted Obama, who's a Democrat. So it's not always true. It's most likely. It's a preferred statement. Okay. Unlike, unlike active labeling, where I get a label, here it is most likely true or false. And by the way, uh, we can actually, if I give two predicates, um, I've seen things like monotonicities and synergies. So for instance, how about the blood pressure with heart attack? then the person could say, as the blood pressure increases, the risk of heart attack increases. But if the blood pressure goes really low, the heart can stop. So there's another thing too. It's very high and very low can cause heart attack. And that's an important information that we can take. So, but the cool thing is the system generates these rules and asks the question. So how does it generate the rule? Basically, it's the same way we are doing it. We learn a bunch of um, trees. And when learning a tree, we compute the probability values here. And, and choose the ones that have the maximum uncertainty. And then you can give it to the user. The user could give me sets of labels. They could give me monotonicity constraints. There could be even things like precision recall and so on. You can get all those information, put them into the model. So what happens is, um, you remember this is the diagram I had earlier for advice learning. I have the data, I have the advice, and I explicitly trade off the data and advice. Here there is an outer loop where basically I'm getting the state space. I'm getting this uh, from this state space. I'm generating some rules that we call as advice subspace. Get the preferences for this advice to the model and continue learning. So uh, what we are doing is we are really um, learning the subspace of rules that are important. What we have shown is that if we do it this way and generate the rules instead of the expert giving up front, if we generate these rules, A, you need a lot less rules than when the expert provides. Because these are rules that are not seen in the data, that are the most uncertain in the data, right? If an expert gives me, he or she is not looking into the data before giving me the knowledge. They're just giving me whatever they know. It's like knowledge vomit. And then you have to figure out what is important and not. Here, um, because this may not even be a good rule, but it is my uncertainty. It is how I understand it. And I think to improve me, you need to help me understand better, right? I, I'm not going to try and map to your brain. You're going to help me fix my brain. And that's why uh, these methods seem to be working well. Um, any questions, by the way, on this at a higher level? We have done this, again, for inverse reinforcement learning. In inverse reinforcement learning, it's actually slightly easy. Um, I, can, I have a bunch of demonstrations, and I have to learn a reward function. Um, you, you compute the, uh, uh, compute the uncertainty with respect to the demonstration and with respect to the reward function, so the two things that you have. And you can actually cluster the states in the, in, the, uh, in the classic reinforcement learning. You can generate rules in the relational reinforcement learning and ask questions. So it works pretty well. Um, recently, um, we have a, a paper at AMS and a paper on knowledge-based system. Actually, it's accepted in KVS. Um, we can do this for hierarchical planning as well. Um, so when I'm decomposing planning, I can uh, split the planner and I say, should I do this task first or this task first? 
and, and the human can say, I prefer you finish. Let's say I'm building in DL. Uh, you could say something like, build the foundation before you go here. In Solitaire, move this card up before you solve the rest. So you can actually ask generalized rules, and, and that also works uh, very well. So what you're trying to do is, in some sense, here you're computing um, the uncertainty with respect to my decomposition and with respect to uh, how, how long it's going to take to solve the problem. So I have a planning cost. I have a distance to the goal and the adherence to preference. I have all three as my um, uh, objective criterion. And I want to get and ask a question that maximizes some combination of these three. And you can get that thing. So again, this is uh, preference elicitation in planning, except we do planning. Um, these preferences are, uh, in our sense, much more well-defined than the work from 20 years back. Uh, because, of course, the science has advanced, so we can do this better now than we did. So that's, again, the same thing. You do, you do some kind of a rollout. Rollout in planning is similar to data. You evaluate each action, compute the uncertainty, and query based on the uncertainty in the decision that you took, and keep going. So basically, the same idea works for uh, uh, probabilistic logic learning, works for reinforcement learning, works for probabilistic planning, hierarchical probabilistic planning. And it's, uh, again, uh, similar results. So um, the thing that I want to show is really how useful these are, right? On one side, on, on the y-axis is the number of percentage of problems that you solve. And these are all the standard, uh, very good planning domains that we work with. So PG Planner is where we guide the preferences. Um, the green is where there are no preferences. You just run planning. Uh, uh, blue are where we get all the preferences up front. And uh, this, uh, my son calls it cyan blue, the light blue color. Um, these are the uh, uh, planner where you ask randomly. Okay, at random point, it's like this guy keeps telling me, "Do you have any question? I have any question. I'm going to ask a question." Right? It's as simple as that. It really doesn't mean, but you can ask a question. And so this is the random thing. Turns out actually random works pretty well because it's anyway more knowledge and it does very well. But the red is better. So percentage of problems solved is uh, pretty good. So we can solve more problems. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is we can actually solve them in the shortest amount of time. Here, higher is better. Here, lower is better. So the red is much lower than getting no preferences. So then just learning to act in the world, then just learning from examples, getting these user advice. And that's why we are hypothesizing that we could be, in some sense, doubly exponential. And we are trying to uh, prove that aspect. Any questions? So these are standard planning problems. We are doing this. Uh, for other problems as well. But to get this to work in real world, um, we need some form of communication. Okay, So what we are now focusing on are interfaces, particularly uh, natural language interfaces um, that we are uh, developing. So this is kind of like a classic solitaire problem that you want to work. But we want to do this in, in, a, in a natural uh, way. Uh, so we are doing these NLP uh, uh, approaches for this. So think about it this way, right? So I have the planner running inside this machine. I am the human. So what I'm going to do is the human is uh, um, going to tell something. I'm saying something. The planner has to understand it. So the way it works is classic semantic parsing inside NLP. And the whole idea of semantic parsing is you take a natural language instruction, maybe in English, you convert into a formal semantic representation, maybe in logic. OK? Now, using that formal semantic representation, those become my constraints. They become my advice. So what I'm going to do is use that advice to figure out how to plan, how to act in the world. OK? And once I figure out how to plan and how to act, I'm going to take those actions. Once I get the results of those actions, I also figure out I'm going to compute uncertainty. I have a question. The question is a logical rule. Let's go back um, here. It is a rule. It's, it's, these are predicates. The comma is a conjunction. This is saying the region is west. And the uh, X is, uh, Y is the governor of that region, and Y's party is democratic. So these are logical rules. I don't expect a human to understand these rules. So what should I do? I should take a rule like this, convert it back to English, call natural language generation. So to close the loop, human says something in English, you convert it into your formal representation, say logic, using semantic parsing, and we use verbnet which is this collection of all predicate uh, names that's been developed in Colorado. Um, we use that to map these concepts, write the rules in formal logic, and then uh, get the feedback from the, uh, ask a question back to the human using natural language generation. Does it make sense? 
So you need both loops. You need natural language parsing, NLP, and NLG, natural language generation, from the human to the agent. And we are closing this loop. This is what we call as communicating with computers. This, again, I'm not going to claim credit for this. The natural language parsing is done by Dan Roth and his group at UPenn. The natural language uh, generation is being done by Julia Hakanmeyer and her group at Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, the, the semantic uh, definitions are provided by Martha Palmer from Colorado. So we do the planning with questions. So we take the formal representation, do the planning, questions. So we build this joint interface, though, uh, to make this kind of possible in many domains. Uh, we are just presenting this because it's very clear. So for instance, the planner says, would you like to interact with the planner while solving? Human says yes. Do you like to give any suggestions before we start? The human says no. The planner says, OK, let me see if I can find a move that works. And they play for some more moves. And then it comes here. And he says, currently, I'm trying to move the eight of diamonds, blocking the three of diamonds. So I don't know where this is, but I think, yeah, somewhere. And then I'm not sure what to do. Please uh, suggest a move. And, and then uh, this person is saying, finish the ace of diamonds. So the ace of diamonds is finished. And then I say, oh, the ace of diamonds was finished. And then maybe solve it, right? So you can ask a question. The human can give feedback and so on. But internally, all this are uh, converted to formal uh, logic representations. You take the representations back. So it turns out that this is not the only way you can give advice. Many, many uh, humans can also give advice when you present visually the domain to them. So the other way we have done is kind of constructed these uh, ER uh, diagrams. We did this for KCAP, and we were doing this even for uh, generating modes in ILP. How do you generate these modes so that somebody who doesn't know how to generate modes, can you at least tell me what is relevant? So you can say, for predicting if the person has tenure, maybe I need to look at the course grade of the students that are involved. Because if the gr grade is not good, if, if a professor is pretty bad in giving grades, let's say I give all Fs and Cs, then that is going to affect my rating, and that's going to affect my tenure. Right? So basically, you can draw these arcs. And humans are very good at um, drawing these long range arcs. And the system can use it to learn from this. So what we have done are built, uh, we have built a few uh, of these ER interfaces that kind of capture the interactions in the domain, present it to the user, and ask questions. So what I'm trying to do is get my students to highlight things. So if I learn a rule that says the tenure depends on course rating, what can you tell me about this? Then as you say, as the rating increases, the chance of tenure increases. So what I want to do is at some point highlight this path and, and get that feedback to the learning system. OK? So the point I want to make is when you bring a human in the loop system, you cannot simply say, ah, I have a deep model. You, human, learn the deep model. They're not going to do it. OK? You have to find out a way to make this deep model learn, uh, interpreted by the human. OK? So we have to figure out how to do this. There's a lot of work on this uh, as well in explainable AI uh, research. So I'm coming to the end of the torture. So I'm going to wrap up um, by essentially motivating um, our research from several uh, different uh, problems that we have worked on. Cardiovascular events and procedures. I talked about this from electronic health record clinical study. One of the things that I really got interested recently is how much you can predict outside non-clinical settings. Outside non-clinical settings, particularly when you work with School of Public Health, um, these uh, people who work with social data, um, the social workers, they have a lot of information. You can actually get these questionnaires for predicting postpartum depression. We can get 95% accuracy outside the clinic. I don't need clinical measurements for diagnosing depression. You can ask a bunch of questions and get this. So how cool would it be to put an app where you can do self-diagnosis? And then you can contact uh, your, your specific uh, provider uh, for, for improving your mental health. So that's what we've been working on. Uh, we can actually figure out rare diseases. That's another population that gets into diseases so often, uh, sorry, depression so often, because they are suffering from a syndrome that is very, very rare. Like one in a million have this problem. But you can actually figure that out by looking at their social interactions, by looking into how long often they log into Facebooks, how much do they post in these groups. You can ask them questions and get that results. And turns out that many of these problems that can be solved outside the clinic can actually make it even more easier to uh, access healthcare systems. So um, we've been working on it. I talked a lot about depression, sorry, uh, Alzheimer's prediction, um, adverse drug events uh, from electronic health records. Now we are looking at chemical structures 
to do adverse drug events. Um, we actually just recently got a Chase paper accepted even on looking at chemical. Uh, we built multiple kernel learning on this, um, relational kernels uh, to learn this using random walks actually. So this works uh, very well. Recently, we've also worked on the PPMI, Parkinson's uh, uh, disease uh, data, and running boosting can actually give us very good results on this as well. So we've got some uh, uh, very good um, results on some of these precision health tasks. And these are really the problems that are driving uh, many of the uh, solutions that I presented uh, earlier. So to conclude, um, if you think about AI in the wild or uh, relational AI in the world, you still have to understand that it's more than a single table. Uh, if there is one message that the students get out of this uh, uh, series of lectures is that um, relational data is everywhere and they are not nicely contained in a single table. They are, they are everywhere. They have multiple data types, they are relational databases. You need to be learning from those um, in a robust manner and that is central to this problem of human uh, allied AI. Um, lifted inference, symmetry of our AI is extremely important. There's been uh, one talk already, and I believe there's one tomorrow on this as well, where you have to look at these uh, uh, symmetries and relations. And I think in my personal thing, sequential uh, models, dynamic models um, that are much more faithful to the data are extremely crucial if you want to apply something in the real world. Actually, even should be uh, using not dynamic Bayesian networks anymore because things can happen at any point. You want to learn a much better model. And deployment, I think this is the key for any success. In this age of the AI bubble, uh, we have to really deploy algorithms that work, okay? If you put an algorithm that fails, LinkedIn, people are gonna unsubscribe. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember Clippy, that's exactly the problem. They deployed something without fully doing the testing. It's actually not a bad tool. Clippy was pretty good, but it was annoying, right? They didn't do the testing properly, and, and that's what happened in 90s. So the question is, can we deploy them very well? And I think, um, and, and this is really Christian's quote here, machine reading, machines that read and understand data science publications is, is probably one of the future that we can do, is probably the best that we can provide you guys as students. So there's a lot of uh, work to do, uh, miles to go before we sleep. So to say, uh, web scale star AI um, is extremely important. Web scale learning with logical models is extremely important. More applications, we work, We started our work with uh, um, Tom Michel on Nell, um, but it kind of slowed down, but going um, after that, relation extraction. Um, generalizing what you learn from one electronic health record to the world is important, okay? While I was on a diamond mine in that uh, clinical study called Cardia, I talked about most of the population was white Caucasians, Middle Eastern people, sorry, middle, Midwestern people, the Midwest in US, the Midwest white Caucasian people. How can I generalize that to the more general population, the African Americans, the um, rest of the Asians, Africans, Europeans, how can we get, and the Australians of course, how can we get this generalized to all the other populations? I think it's extremely important. So we have to figure out how to achieve generalization. Um, and we are now, one of our research focus, our recent Amazon award has been on learning from multiple experts because you cannot ask all the questions to the same expert. People are different in different expertise. If you understand and model their expertise perfectly, you can ask um, questions separately. I'll just give you the intuition. We are working on a meta EM, an EM algorithm which tells me the expectation over the expertise of, a, uh, of an expert. Okay, so in some sense, I'll ask, I'll, my model says, this is a good question. I can ask Fabrizio here, or I can ask Gerson here. And, and I distinguish when I can get the best answer. And instead of asking everybody, and then somehow pooling this, I can go to the specific expert and ask a question. And that's what we are working on. Of course, uh, we need truly hybrid models, and I'm gonna highlight truly several times, because we don't do that. We try and make assumptions. Um, anytime there is continuous data, we put a Gaussian without thinking, is this Gaussian or not? You got to think about it, think about the modeling perspective, and then build the models. Of course, combined with efficient inference techniques and learning techniques, you need to scale things up uh, to work. And uh, now I have my tenure, so I can dream. And I have a, the dream problem, which is relational from DPs. Partially observable sequential decision making in relational world, I think is, I mean, it's probably one of the hardest problems inside AI. And, and I think that, uh, at least my belief, is that uh, relational AI is the way to go if you want to solve this. Okay? With that, I'm done. I can ask uh, any, I mean, I can take any questions that you want. All right? Thanks.